My guest has been to hell and back and lived to tell the world about it, but realized he needed to share the wonders of what he encountered in heaven as well, because it far outweighs anything this world could ever offer. Next on The Reboot. Hey, what's going on, friends and family? Welcome to The Reboot, Spirit Reboot, a channel dedicated to you, the revivalist and reformer that God is using to completely reboot the modern church system. And so you're not going to want to go anywhere. I got on with me today, Brian Melvin, the author of two books, Land Unknown and Heaven Beckons. And, and his near-death experience has been all over social media, especially here on YouTube. If you, you've probably seen, you know, some of his interviews and some, you know, some of his testimony regarding his experience with the Lord, not just in hell, but also in heaven. And, and I love that title, Brian. I love Heaven Beckons. It couldn't have come out at a better time when the world is just in such chaos, I mean, we are just on the doorstep of the tribulation here. The end times are upon us, the last days, and people need hope. People need something that they can look to because the, the promises of this world, man, are fading away. Everything that the world offers is nothing compared to what God has in store for His people. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I wanted to, you know, just have you talk about this this book and and also the other side of the coin here. You know, God had had taken you, you know, into the depths of hell, and it was that was a traumatic thing for you. I mean, you talk about how traumatic. I mean, it would have freaked me out. I get freaked out just by going to the doctor and hearing what he has to say. You know, I mean, imagine seeing cubes in hell and seeing all these crazy, you know, monsters, demon, demonic things. I mean, I I don't like messing. I'm a deliverance guy, but I don't like messing with demons. I just just leave me alone. Just get me into the presence of God. And so I'm really excited today to talk about your encounter with Jesus in the heavenlies. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, amen. Um, yeah, if people are interested. I'm doing a deep dive into my first book, A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion, and on my YouTube channel. And my YouTube channel is called The Christian Marauder. I'm also heading up, uh, moderating another YouTube site, and we changed the name over to the Renegade Hour. It used to be with uh, Josh Peck, but anyway, my uh, YouTube channel is The Christian Marauder. You know, it's at uh, YouTube there. So that's what I've been doing. Um, if the people who don't know me or know my story, I in 1980 I drank some bad water and contracted cholera and and also something like dysentery, which I don't know what type of dysentery I had. All, all I found was a note that I wrote and what I had, and there was another thing I had, probably some type of toxin from the algae. I basically dehydrated, died, and then came back to life, and in that process process, I saw hell, and and I was an atheist at the time, and I wasn't saved, and I just, you know, it was like, as I tried to explain in my YouTube channel, it was, and also in my book, it was like, it was like God having it out with me, and pointing something out to me that I wasn't as smart as I thought, you know, as, as well as being judged by God, and facing that judgment after you die is, is incredible, because there's no stone unturned, there's no place you can hide. And it's true, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And after you're judged, uh, I, I went and went into hell. And I didn't know if I was really going to come back. I, it was so overwhelming and everything. And, and the Lord told me to say His name and His title, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, when I was down there. That's all I did when I was down there. And it was like walking in like a blank stare, but... So many things happened, it was very hard to process over time. And so I wrote the first part of the book just from notes that I compiled after I had the experience. Then a few years later, you know, late 1980s, 87, 88, I started writing a man, actually it was 86, 87, I wrote a 40 page manuscript. And that's all I could do. I didn't know how to write the book because so much happened. And you know, how, how, how can you explain? what the spirit world is like. How do you explain it's like a different dimension. You can 
Like, for example, I found myself walking in hell, looking into these cubes or cells and seeing people inside, but I could see inside the cell as I was standing outside the cell, but I was seeing, my, seeing what it was like in the cell for each person I passed that we stopped and gazed inside long enough. And then you would get downloads on people as you walked by, real quick snippets of their entire life history. Can't even explain it. And all I could say was Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, as I was following this hideous creature, which I nicknamed Lizard Breath, is my nickname for him. It's a, it's a derogatory term, but it's not, a, it's with a respect. It's like, you know, combat veterans, you know, you go to combat with something and you give a benign sounding name to your enemy, but you know you respect their tenacity. And so I just called this thing lizard breath afterwards because his breath was pretty foul. And so I took this tour of hell, so to speak, if that's the only way I can put it. At the time, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know if I was going to be there or not. So I saw people in various stages of torment. It's like the Bible says, there's levels or degrees of torment in, in hell. And I had a lot of things answered. It was, a lot of my old arguments were answered there. So when I came back to life and I began this search to find out things like what happened to me? Why did I see what I saw? What was going on? And so I began processing it. So when I wrote, finally got around to writing the book, I tried several times to write it, but I just couldn't capture everything. So I sat down and it felt like this was time to write it. So I wrote it and I prayed about it. And then that was my last my so my first book came out, A Land Unknown, Hell's Dominion, if I just kind of hold it up there, if you can see it. But And so I wrote that book, and and everything came to me. And I was able to write it in a way, uh, using a John Robb creative nonfiction, where you, um, I just took, like, flashbacks, seeing, like, when I was lying in the hospital trying to recover, and how I felt, and trying to capture that, and then give you an idea of what I was like when I was a younger person and what I did in my life, and then leading up to my after-death experience. Everything's based, everything happened in there is true. And so I was able to write it. I was able to capture the uh, how it was, walking in the place, and I wrote it from the perspective I had back in the early 2000s. And I have more perspective now. And like I said, that goes with my deep dive into the book this year. It's part nine. I'll be doing part ten tomorrow, I think. If I think I might be doing part ten tomorrow, I'll see of my book. And just going, taking my time, going through it, showing people different things, why things are. So if you're interested, you know, on Colorado time, mountain time, it's 8.30 in the morning. Eastern coast time, it's 10.30 in the morning. That is at the ChristianMarauder.com. And now, um, later, about three years later, just to make it real interesting for you, I, I basically was a basket case when I came back. I didn't know what was going on. I had all my problems, even though I got saved right after that. Uh, when I came back to, and got home from the hospital, I sat in a beanbag chair and my roommates left and shaking their heads like, you, you, you idiot, you know, <laughs> you died on us, now you're back and um, you should have let us take into the hospital sooner, but you know, I, I digress on that. And so they left to go to work, I sat in a beanbag chair and said, Lord, I never want to go back to the awful place. Take me, I'm yours. That's how I got saved. And I knew something dramatic happened to me. And some of you here listening just may have experienced the same thing. You felt great after you got saved, but then life settles in. And, and problems you had in life, all these things hit you. And you're confronted with a lot of things. And so you have to make a lot of changes. And my changes were slow. Because I didn't understand a lot of things. And so it took me about a year later to even start going back to church. And because I know I was trying to be a man and do it on my own, you, you can't, you need Jesus. And so, so, so I came back to church. I told a pastor about what had happened, and he said, You should write a book. He was a Southern Baptist pap pastor. And then I went into a church of God and Pentecostal type churches and Assembly of God, so forth, etc. And so, um, yeah, I wrestled with what happened to me, and very seldom would I tell people, and I was going through a lot of stuff. But at the same time, the Lord was growing me spiritually, because everything that is that happened to me 
in what I saw in hell as well as what I'm going to talk about, about seeing heaven, is scriptural. It's in the Bible. But little did I know that I was going to see heaven because, you know, I was still a messed up. I was trying to get my life together. I was struggling with things, problems, issues, traumas, dramas like everybody else at that time. And probably some of you guys are still doing that. <laughs> um, so I was dealing with a lot of stuff and... I wasn't looking to go to heaven, I wasn't trying to, I wasn't even considering it, I wasn't even thinking about it. You know, I'm just trying to process what this stuff happened to me because I had post-traumatic stress from my experience of seeing hell, and that is a traumatic experience, and trying to process that, and why you saw that, and why you came back, and basically survivor's guilt is, is really, really true, because I look back and go... I don't deserve to come back. I know I don't deserve to come back. And so my concept of God's grace is probably a lot deeper, more impactful than most people. Because I know I don't deserve to come back. I know perfectly well that I, I, I deserve hell. No other way to say it. Because the Lord proved it beyond me without doubt that I deserve that place. Mm. Then he resurrected me yeah. out of that place. He literally saved me out of, out of the miry pit, so to speak. And... Uh, here I am alive trying to process this stuff and so I in church I was trying to work myself to death trying to forget I didn't want to be around people I wanted to be isolated but the Lord had me what it what put me in church and before I even asked for anything uh, I was made head intercessor of a church not even knowing what intercessor it was I was doing street witnessing at the time and our street witnessing, I thought all this stuff was normal. I mean, I, I still do. I still think it's normal. We go on the street with this, I used to go with this guy, and this is how he trained us. Go there, we pray, walk up to somebody, and, out, you know, we talk to him a little bit. And then next thing you know, we had all these teenagers around us. And so, uh, so this one kid came up to us, and he was Said, he said, blank this, blank that, and that, you know, if, 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 if blankety blank Jesus Christ is really real, then he can heal my blankety blank arm because he had a broken wrist. He just broke his wrist that, that morning. And so the guy looked over and says, okay, we'll, we'll pray for you. He said, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to heal his arm and heal his wrist. And, and the guy says, oh, ha, ha, it's still broken. He's waving it in our face. He flipped us off, walked off. Next night he came, he didn't have the, have the cast on. <laughs> <laughs> and it got loose, so they went back to reset it, and they did an x-ray, and it was fused back. It was healed. Oh. And so oh, he came up to Jesus. us and says, Did Jesus heal my arm, heal my hand. I says, yeah, he's real. And so that's how I learned to street mm. witness. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what we did. So what happened after that? That guy left. I met another guy, and uh, he, he rented a room from me. We had a, a, a revival, a mini revival on this with street kids in Fort Collins, Colorado, for about two and a half, maybe three years. And so that, to me, was was normal in doing things, moving in the gifts of the Spirit seemed very normal to me. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have any, I didn't have any um, qualms about it, or no, no training on it. And so, yeah, no frame of reference. This is just new for you, yeah. And so, I still do, I still do that. But you know, so I still kind of messed up. I had my problems. The people who knew me then knew I had problems. And like everybody else, the Lord's working on you, sanctifying you. So that, so one night. Um, I was at church. I was, you know, I was in the praise band. I did street witnessing. I was leading the um, um, prayer ministry, uh, uh, intercessors group without knowing what I was doing. I just learned from everybody else what they're doing, and they could see in the spirit the same thing I was seeing. So I said, oh, "Okay, so this is how you pray. This is how you do spiritual warfare." I learned on, I learned on the job, and then I it was that night. Uh, we had a series of revivals at, in this church, and so this, and so it was the last night of revival, was Sunday night. I had to get up in the morning um, to go to work, and I also started a window cleaning business and starting a janitorial business at the same time. I was still working because it's doing things in the evening, and then going to church, doing all this stuff. I don't know how I did it. I, I was just, I was driven. That's I was driving myself crazy because I didn't want to, you know. You didn't want to be alone, but you wanted to be alone, then you found that God put you in front of all these people, and then I kept myself a little too busy. And so at this meeting, the 
they were, how do I say it? I, they had like two or three people to be baptized, five people maybe. I thought, oh, phew. it's not going to be 30 or 40 like the past few nights where I was doing this. And we were staying up most of the night you know, until 1, 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning sometimes. We get everybody water baptized. And Well, I thought wrong. They had about 30 more people to baptize that night. And so I didn't get out of there until after 1. I was in a very bad mood. And I got home. And I... Um, people don't know this, but I went to a what is known as Outward and Bound. It's a mountaineering survival course, and it was in out of Durango, Colorado, course C151. So most of our teachers were uh, Rangers, Delta Force, um, Green Berets. Ex, you know, they were they were out of the military, and so. They taught us how to go, what is known as the drone zone, how to lie down and rest, recruit, get up, and go at it in a survival situation and keep moving. And so here I am, dead tired that night. I was mad. I was angry. I was not in a holy mood. And I um, just said, okay, I got a few hours. I can, well, I had about an hour and a half. I can just lie down and just, I can zone out for a second. Then my alarm will go off. The sun will come through the window. I'll be up. I'll just, and I'll just go. I'll just go, go to work. Then I'll go do, do my other job at night and, and just go, then sleep later. You know, no problem. That's how I was back then. And so, I laid down on the bed, my dog was peaceful, and all of a sudden, this is no lie, I just tell you, I heard his booming voice saying, Awake, arise, stand to your feet. It was a booming voice, and, I, and the light, room lit up with this bright light. <laughs> and I just said to myself, go away. I said a few nice expletives, I have to admit. And I threw the covers over my head and said, I ain't getting up. You know, shut. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I realized, what, was this a dream? Yeah. So, so you, it didn't occur to you that this was God. It's just you didn't know what was going on. No, I was in a very bad mood. I was. Mm. I was actually complaining that I, I got stuck at the church. I had to put up the sound equipment. I had to lock mm. the doors of the church. I was complaining the whole way home. I wasn't in a very pleasant <laughs> mood. And so, when that happened, you know, I just okay. Then my dog got real happy because her tail was wagging, looking at somebody or something. A German Shepherd then. So my German Shepherd was wagging her tail like somebody was there, and then she just laid back down, and I, okay, I went back to sleep. It's pitch black, and it happened again. It happened, it happened three times, and I had the same response. Except the last time it happened, I said, wake, arise, stand to your feet. I said, oh, no, i got to get up in the morning and go to work. Can you wait? And I said, oh, no, I missed the rapture. And so I threw the covers <laughs> off me. I literally have a side door going out to right. I lived in a trailer then out in the east near Alt, Colorado, actually. So I got out and looked out and I, oh, what's this? I didn't miss the rapture. I didn't know what was going on. So I sat back down. I felt this great peace. And my dog wouldn't go outside. She was sitting and sitting down. And I looked over. It looked like somebody was petting her. And her ears were going back. And I heard a still, quiet voice. And I know it's the Lord. He said, do you, re do you remember how you left before? And I said, yes, Lord. That's what I said. So I laid back down on my bed. I remember looking at my dog. And she was very hot, excited, just sitting there, chilling out. You know, someone was petting her ears. And I didn't think anything strange about anything. And then I just laid back down. And you got to understand, it was nighttime, yet I could see in the darkness. I, don't, I can't explain this. And then I laid down, and all of a sudden, I left my body. And I went up above my body through a, um, a, a what do you call it? A, a storage space above the bed with sliding doors. When I got, when I came back, the sliding door was taken off the hinge and laying down inside there. I had nothing in storage up there anyway. It was empty. So, you know, what happened happened. There was a little sign afterwards that happened. But anyway, so I went there and I went through and I found myself in the same dark void that I, I saw before, you know, when I died. And I was going toward a light, just like I did before. And I could hear this beautiful music, just like I heard before, you know, when I died. This time I wasn't dead, but I was like being translated or shown heaven or something. So I was going back toward the light, but this time I was going home, and I could hear the music explaining all the mysteries of the universe, as I call it. 
answering questions of who God is, extolling the, the virtues of God's character traits and his nature in ways that it'd be too, too profound to articulate and you couldn't really. If you tried, some person probably would uh, try to market these and, and, and sell them, which you wouldn't be able to do anyway because, you know, that's pretty much um, how I wrote it in my book, um, Heaven Beckons, which will come out in, uh, around in, in either April or May. May 7th is the target date. It could come a little bit sooner. Don't know yet. But when Heaven Beckon comes out, I, I, I show you what happened and, and floating in this void toward this place, I was going home. It was like, I, this time I wasn't being judged, I was going home. This was a great feeling. And I heard all these great mysteries and stuff, and I understood what it meant, that things in heaven are not lawful to utter. We all hear all that from the critics. But some things God will reveal to people that it's okay to say. There's, there really is no way to describe everything about heaven in, in five easy words, and you can't um, share some of the details about God's character traits in nature because some Yahoo out there will try to market and sell it and, and, and God's not going to per per permit that so it is unlawful so a lot of those things I left out of the book those are personal and I won't tell anybody this side of heaven what they were and so floating through there I came there I was going through the same rock that I saw before and this time I saw Jesus standing on the rock like I did before, but this time he didn't have a, his, his face wasn't veiled. And he welcomed me, he spoke to me like in thought, just a few words and just this paragraphs and tons of meaning in each word. There's nobody speaks like Jesus, nobody speaks like him. And so I, I landed feet first in front of him, I fell before him again and I someone picked me up or I got back up somehow there and stood before him and he said just come follow him he's going to basically show me heaven and he said come follow me or come this way I knew that we were going to see something basically he shared with me the best way I can put it is you know my heaven experience was to calm me down about seeing hell it's almost like even even a double dose of grace because I was a mess I was, I was running myself ragged I thought I had to keep myself, work myself to death to keep my salvation, which I was dead wrong about that. And uh, you know, I, I didn't want to go back to hell because I kept working, like I'm do all the churchy stuff and all this stuff. I was just yeah. driving myself crazy. He just basically said, "Peace, be still, rest. Come, I'm going to show you. You've seen a lot. You've seen a lot. Meaning, you saw hell. He permitted me to see hell, and." Yeah. And now he's going to take me here, like I said, right wrote in my book, it's going to calm me down about seeing hell, which it did. And I still had... Let me, let me ask you something, because you said not, no one speaks the way that he does. Describe what... How did you know it was the Lord? How did you know it was Jesus? I mean, people... And I'm, and I'm just playing devil's advocate because people always say you know like you know the the enemy you know can can trick you and uh, but I, I would think that there's this great sense of peace that would come over you in his presence that yeah. all the cares of the world all of your fears everything just drains away right and that yeah. perfect love just yeah. must must have come through in that moment where you could trust this is this is really this is really him yes that's pretty accurate but the other thing is that when you're really standing before him you'll know him and what the reason i say that is that you have a great respect for him he melts you <laughs> that's all i gotta say it melts yeah. you you um it's like yes lord whatever you say because there's no one that speaks like him and, and right. they despy the um the pharisees sent spies to spy on jesus and they came back and trying to entrap jesus on his words and they asked him well what did you find out he says there's nobody speaks like him because when he speaks mm. it's it's like warehouse full of information hits you and mm. it unpacks in your mind and it's mm. like the bible says the word of god is sharper than any two-edged sword cutting this under the thoughts and tints of the heart and that's what it's like because imagine those guys who heard jesus had their hearts cut open and they were probably exposed they're thinking as they were hearing something about jesus talking maybe about some lesson on the uh, Beatitudes or something, they were hearing something that was saying, uh, wow, uh, 
no one speaks like him because he just exposed our motives in our heart that, you know, this, mm -hmm. we were trying to set him up, but I just got convicted. That's how you know and it's words are spirit and life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. spirit and life. And that's how he smoke, spoke, and plus he has an uh, incredible smile. And a lot of people ask me, what did Jesus look like? Well, first, when I first saw him, he looked like a, a well-weathered Jewish guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, a Nazareth haircut, you know, kind of long. And his eyes, I, I can't describe his eyes. And my eyes are more hazel green. His would be more of and what I saw as a hazelish, brownish green. But they would change to blue. Mm. They would change into pools of fire. Then they would change. And then his vision would change. Um, this will sound strange, but it's in the scripture. And in Mark chapter 16, the guys were walking along the road, and Jesus appeared to him in what? Another form. He appeared to them in another form out, uh, while Peter and them were fishing in John chapter 22, and they didn't recognize who he was. And, and uh, so his vision would change. He'd be like an average, like a Jewish guy. Well, you know in shape and all that and then he would appear like the Lord of Glory like white hair beard you know flames of fire are he'd appear best way I can put it is it would be Zachariah I would say I saw one like the Son of Man there's no other way to, way to say it and um, you got to understand that the spiritual dimension is far different than, than, than what we are. And we do great disservice measuring what the Bible says about Jesus and stuff on a linear Western mindset, or even an Eastern mindset, on a human mindset. Because this is because Jesus appeared in another form. So often after his resurrection to different people, they didn't recognize who he, who he was. And that's how it was. But I, I knew who it was, but his, he would change. And so I saw the one like the Son of Man, so I followed him up this path along the wall. And we walked in up to this gate. I call it a pearly gate. And, I, and I, I talk about this quite often when I do my testimony on this. And I, we just stood outside this gate for a minute. And there's a big bluish pearl-like gate with um, blue, living blue swirls in it, kind of just going around and had a had a passageway, a narrow passageway going through it. And these angels would come out of this gate and they would go do tasks. They would answer prayer, they would give a message to somebody, they would send to somebody to help somebody, you know, they'd give warnings, so forth, etc. I was seeing all these angels come out, different types of angels too, and some of them, if you saw some of these in, in real life, you'd freak out. You know, Ezekiel um, chapter, uh, you know, I think the first chapter talks about uh, one of these angels appearing as uh, with all uh, call it spheres of light and all eyes. Yeah, that would scare the bejeebies out of people if you saw something like that. But those are the type of things that would go out from this. Different types, different ones, and typical looking angels, whatever. And they would go forth and out. And and their wings to me reminded me of wings of light. Not so much about feathers, but wings of, of light. And they would go forth out of here, out of the, the gate, of, this particular gate in heaven. There's 12 gates there. This is one of them. And they would go out and do their task. Give somebody warning. And, these, and an angel can appear as a human being, too. So there's different types of encounters that people have. It's verified. And so... I was seeing all this transpire, how people would pray and, and how a prayer would be answered. And, and the Lord was just talking to me a little bit about there, and he said, it's time to go in. So we walked into this uh, this pearly gate, no other way to say it. And and I knew intuitively, because he was speaking to me, to pay attention to everything. Uh, look, at this, look at everything. Pay, pay attention. Behold, pay attention to everything. Look at the sign. Look at the symbolism. Look at... Everything that I learned previously in the Bible, you know, helped me understand things, but this was even more intense because we walked through this pearly gate, and the first thing I noticed, you know, a lot of critics say, oh, you're crazy. Well, that's okay. You'll probably see this place, too, in, in due time. But anyway, 
It looked like to me someone took uh, these nails and chiseled and took a spear, some place for like a spear point, and hollowed out this walkway through this pearl. And so that's a symbolism of of, um, of what the cross did for us, because we were not allowed into heaven until Jesus paved the way by the cross. And that's what reminded me of I was going through this gate, was seeing that. And Jesus was walking in front of me, and you people were behind me, coming through too. It was one person at a time walking through there. There's one thing that I'll step back and say so people can get a, a feel for what I'm saying. There's no way to describe eternal time. Um, there's no past, present, or future. Yet there's a rhythm to it. You can't even, there's a flow to it, but it's not unlike this. So as I was, unlike this mortal time, linear time that we have, and this still affects me to this day. I, I just, and people had actual after death experiences or real experiences will talk about time. Time is, as we know it here, is, is limited. And, and then you're touched by eternity, you're always aware of this eternal time. And so I was going, walking here, and it was like I was able to peer into the past while standing, walking through this, this corridor, through this giant white pearl with blue thing, the light coming through it, walking through Jesus. It looked like um, it was chiseled by nails, and I kind of touched my finger along the wall. And I'm walking because he told me to follow him. This, he's gonna, and so it was like seeing through a cloud or a mist darkly or a mirror darkly, so to speak. And you could see the events that transpired before the cross. You could see just before it all happened how Judas was uh, betraying and setting up the plot to get rid of Jesus with you know the people who want to get rid of him, the religious leaders. I couldn't make out faces or anything like that. I, I could hear the language, couldn't understand stand it, but I knew what they were saying. And it was like peering in there and seeing that, and seeing inside the person's hearts, too. And there's a reason they think uh, Judas is called the son of perdition, and I'll leave it at that. And so we, I could see all this stuff. I could see how, uh, basically, how people do whatever they possibly can to slay the what is decent and good without even knowing it. And they're doing a great job of it now, as a matter of fact. That's why people feel kind of defeated right now, because they see whatever is decent and good being slayed right before their eyes and replaced with bizarreness. I don't want to get into that right now. But I'm looking at that, and I could see how... Um, what happened in the garden. I could see him, Jesus being betrayed. I saw him being abandoned by everybody. And then as all this was happening, you know, is, is, is something I learned after I came back from the, the hell was the message of the cross. And I've been teaching it ever since. But this was more clarification to it. This time I understood that all the events of the cross, the power of the cross is this. We weren't there. We weren't there, Chris, but we were there. We did crucify him. We did put him on the cross. Mm. How our life proves it. How many times we sold out people for 30 pieces of silver? How many times have we lied about people, betrayed people, mm. abandoned people, neglected people? Boy. And uh, just like Jesus, how many bore false witness? Put people in trial in your mind, setting them up as a loser, no good, they're, they're never mounted, they're a heretic, they're this, they're that. How many times have we done these things? And when you look at the cross and the events, I say the 24 hours before Jesus was nailed to the cross, it shows you that. We, this is iniquity in the heart. We take what is good and we destroy it. We have an mm -hmm. ability to do good, Chris, and all the folks out there, but we cannot maintain that goodness. We cannot maintain goodness because we will end up crucifying. This is human nature. And yeah, we, we are our own worst enemy. We definitely are our own worst enemy. I mean, we blame the devil for a lot of things, but it's inherently just part of it's it's that it's that sin nature that we wrestle with, and, and is I mean, we will do anything. Our, I mean, 
I've been in these these encounters with the Lord. Was like, I will. I just want to. I was want everything ripped out of me that isn't of you. I can't take it anymore <laughs> because that's a real. That's real godly sorrow. That's. It's not all you know unicorns and rainbows and and and, and tell me there's no cake in heaven, is there, Brian? <laughs> no, no cake in heaven and Disneyland's not up there either. Uh, no, there's no oh, Disneyland up there. There's no, there's no yeah, we're coasters. all guilty. We're all guilty. Yeah. No, you no, know, no one is righteous, not one. And yeah. then, and when you see that the scripture come alive, you yeah, know that's what I see. You know this is, scripture come alive. I was just walking in there, and then, and then all of a sudden, I can see Jesus emerging into this bright light, and I came out of that, and it was I just understood intuitively grace and the cross and what He did for us, and I would even I even loved the Lord even more after that. Because of what he did, and none of us deserve it. <laughs> none of us mm-hmm. deserve mercy. Yep. We deserve wrath. And like I say, for myself, I found mm-hmm. grace instead. And uh, that's what he offers. And so we walked out of this place and into what I describe as a, as a field, and I nicknamed it. This is my name for it. I call it the field of reunion because it just describes what I saw there. So we walked out into this place, and you know everything's perfect. Grass there, perfect. It was the most beautiful wow. place I've ever seen. There's really no the most beautiful place on earth can't even compare because there's there's no yeah. Death. A lot of there's people no... a lot of people have described this field. You're not the only one. Mm-hmm. There's so that's a that's a, there's a common denominator here. Mm-hmm. That that's there's a consensus well, yeah, about this, this field of reunion. About 1980. Three-ish. <laughs> wow! Wow! I have a photograph wow. of me standing in, next to my parents right after it happened. I mean, several months after this happened, um, mm. I had to fly back, and and I flew back to visit my parents for for a vacation, and then came back to Colorado after that. But but so it was about 1983-ish, and so uh, I was standing in this field in in heaven there. And looking at all the stuff going around, and I, the first thing that hit me was I was in a land of liquid love. This was a love unlike what we think love is. And it's not sickly sweet. It's not the fake love that I, that I experienced in, in hell in some of these cubes. Um, you know, people in hell, you know, uh, they think they are in heaven, but they've been resuscitated a little too soon. They never realize where they were. They don't know the deception uh, of hell. But I'm not talking about hell. I'm talking about heaven. And here in heaven, this this love was so much different. It, 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 it was from a person. It was from from God's nature. Just just you understand something about what it says in in First John there. God, I want to read it from the Greek text. It would mean God as to His nature is one that loves, cherishes, edifies, builds up. He'll he'll discipline if he needs to, so forth. So that you you have an idea of what what God's love is. And this was just hit you all at once, and it's the most intense, peaceful type of love, and it just sort of melts you. It's just, it's just like, wow, I just, and so I'm just standing there, and I was, I was clean. I never felt so clean in my life. <laughs> I never felt so good in my life. I'm just sitting there, I finally go, I don't want to leave this place, is what I was thinking. This is great. You know, I knew I was going to leave, but you know, I, I, he is showing me this because I saw hell. I knew that. I was going to come back too, but I didn't want to come back. I just wanted just to sit in the field and watch what was going on for the rest of eternity. I was satisfied just to stay right there. But no, he didn't show me around and I saw these people come out and I wrote, I wrote this in my book too and some of it, you know, I describe in my testimony like, you know, I did see this guy come out of, of the, right behind me a little bit, a few people behind me came out, and he was surprised to see his dad coming down and coming up to meet him into this field, not coming down, but coming up, you know, just walking from the distance coming to him, and up to him, coming up to him, and he, and he said, uh, Dad, are you here? You know, and yet I understand. I knew what was going on, and Jesus just sat there and stand, stood there, and he was smiling. And I was watching this, and I was standing next to him, and he was smiling. And I was kind of like, he's kind of like showing me to watch this, and um, and so he, so I knew about this this family. This guy tried to witness to his dad, and he dad wouldn't listen to him, cussed him out. He got so mad at his dad for being such a reprobate and mean guy and all that stuff. He said, I never see you again. 
So when his sisters and brothers call him and says, your, our dad has cancer, why don't you go talk to him? He wants to talk to you. He says, no, I'm not going. So he missed, he just walked away from him totally. Didn't want to, because he, he had a grudge against him. And uh, so here he's surprised to see him. Then his dad says, you know, son, I remember your words to me and just on my deathbed, I, I asked Jesus to come into my life and you're right. Thank you. I love you. And they hugged each other and all that animosity, all that struggle just evaporated. So they walked off into heaven. I call it the field of reunion because that's what I was seeing. Every, all, everything set set right. Before you go in any further in heaven, in this field, everything is set right. And I saw women who, 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 who and, and, and husbands and, and wives who've lost children, young children, and all of a sudden they see their child coming toward them, and all of a sudden they grow up in front of us. It's not hard to say, hard to explain. And they welcome in, and, and, and they go back and, and enjoy heaven together, the rest of eternity together. And then I saw some, some Christian gals who, in their running around before they got saved, they, they had abortions. And, and this one lady came up there, and she felt so guilty. And um, she saw this little infant coming into her. It just, it just tears me up every time I think about it. And the, and the baby got bigger, stood up, and says, Hi, Mom. Don't worry. Everything's forgiven. We have a lot of time to play together. And she melted, and they cried, they hugged each other, and walked off. And, um, because, you know, this woman carried away the guilt, and then she became a Christian, she had the guilt of what she did. She was talked into it. I mean, come on, you know. Um, uh, I just wish people had a little more, more grace and mercy in their heart when they see... Christians who are dragged before the Sanhedrin, so to speak, and, and, and say, you're caught in adultery, you had an abortion, there's no hope for you, you know. No, Jesus had mercy to a woman who was caught in adultery, and he said, sin no more, and man, she's very grateful. And uh, here we are, like Sanhedrin, a lot of people are, and they just can't accept this. That heaven could be a place where you're reconciled, or, or you ate too much pizza, and this was just a hallucination, or you're just out to make a ton of money on it, you're just out to fleece people. You know, I just, how dare those people say those things? You know, I know perfectly well I come under a stricter judgment than anybody else for what I say and teach. That was one of my call, I two call to ministry scriptures. One was I, Isaiah chapter. 61 verses 1 through 5 there and the next one was do not desire to be teachers or, or you'll receive a stricter judgment and I said I accept that so I know that so you know you know so I just wish people would kind of get off the, the, this this kick I know there's fake heaven visitations I know there's people out there who, who do this to make money and, and exploit people and make themselves out to be something they're not but a real heaven experience is not like that. And you can't judge everybody based upon a few heretics and a few crazy, whacked out people who just want to be significant and important. But, you know, they, 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 they can be saved too. Hallelujah. That's what yeah. I know. I just pray yeah. that they get saved. Yeah. Brian, I know in my spirit and in my, in my knower, my deep knower that what you had was real because it's just, it's all about redemption. It's all about. You know, that's what Christ, like this, this stream of consciousness that you're talking about, where there's no time or there's no space, it's a reality of what He has accomplished, of who He is, and what He has restored in us and back to us, and that's desperately what humanity needs right now. There's someone out there, and I just got a word of knowledge from the Spirit, you're, you're weeping right now. You're feeling the guilt you're feeling the condemnation, but the Lord wants to set you free from that today. He wants to wipe the slate clean, just as Brian was saying. He wants to make you as white as snow, that this encounter, this experience can be yours. That door of faith can open, open the, that can open up this reality to you. This stream of consciousness can, can be yours, right, Brian? Yes, this right. stream That's of consciousness, right. this reality of heaven. We don't need to just wait 
to the great by and by. We can have this, this encounter with, with Jesus now and today. This, this overwhelming, reckless love of God that will wipe the slate clean if you will trade in your life for His. If you will lay it all down for Him right now. It can be yours right now. In Jesus name, I just pray for you right now that the Holy Spirit would come upon you and fill you to overflow. Let the presence, yes. Father, let your presence and let your grace hit that one watching right now. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes, Heavenly Father, just let them touch them if they have guilt or shame. They, just, they got, they got a, an inheritance in heaven waiting for them, just like Ephesians says. Yeah. And that's that's what it, that's what I, what I try to express in my book is a little bit of that inheritance that waits people is reconciliation and uh, being reconciled. You reconcile to God. He gives you this great love. It changes you. you before you're allowed to go into heaven, so to speak. Uh, any anything against somebody's taken care of it sounds strange but it's just what I saw I can't explain it and so I, I remember there and, and the Lord spoke to me there after seeing the grand reunions I was seeing and people reconciled he, he showed me he just basically do you want to go into the city or do you want to go over here and he already knew my he already knew the answer he already knew the answer I had enough of cities I lived in enough of cities and urban life I just said I like the countryside because I loved going um, down to my grandparents' farm, or you know, my, either my dad's side of the family or my mom's side of the family, and and my mom's side of the family go down and work on the farm for a, you know a summer or so. I always loved that, so I had kind of a best of both worlds. So I just said, let's just go this way. I like the trees, you know. There's a, some trees over there. I want to go see. So I walked down. I called a um, looked like a gold road, gold dirt, basically. You have to get the book to find out more. But anyway, we walked into, we walked to the woods, and uh, it was like everything I saw correlated with the Bible, and it went right back to Isaiah 61 about the trees of the plant. Yeah, the Lord will, you know, basically, um, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to give good news to the crushed in spirit, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, set those at liberty who are held in bondage. And, you know, you talk about the judgment of the Lord and you have talk about his goodness and that, uh, you know, if you have, he'll give you the spirit of joy for, for the spirit of heaviness and all that stuff. And he says, it says that, that it's so that you may be plantings of the Lord. So where you are, are right now in this life, he's healing you up, making you new inside so that you can be a a tree of righteousness, his shine, the shade of his righteousness on other people. We don't have righteousness of ourselves; it's his. And a lot of people like to uh, be their own shade and and a shade of judgment, or whatever. That's not not how it is. This is a shade of a righteousness. You can rest and find rest. You can get your heart healed, your crushed spirit healed. You can get free of this stuff. You're going to go through a process in this life. And it's going to reveal things, and it was we as a church are supposed to help people nurture that and find that freedom and help them through. And that's what he kind of showed me in this in this in this patch of woods. And I, I can't really describe it any better than that, you know, in a, in a nutshell. And then we do we walked all over the place in this beautiful place, and much of it you'll have to read in the book. And and I, I and I also had lessons on God's sovereignty. I would see people um, look like they were in school, but not in a building, but sitting outside in little groups. And then somebody of, uh, you know, I saw all these old saints of God, though I don't even know who they are. I mean, and I don't even ever tell anybody's name, and most of the people here I never even heard of. And they would uh, talk about their life, and as they were talking, the whole sovereign plan of God that happened in their life was revealed and all glory went back to the Lord and how he got them through pain, trouble, um, and circumstances. Like Jesus says, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. You can see them overcoming this stuff. And people are learning about God's character traits and his great nature in these, in this particular area that I saw. And that's where I got a, a lesson of how God's sovereignty works. Well, he will, uh, we may not think we're doing too much for the Lord, but all of a sudden you're driving along and, um, you get delayed. 
and you stop in a restaurant. I'm just using this as an example. And, uh, and you can't do anything. It's winter outside, and you go, oh, I got stuck here. What am I going to do? But while you're there, you give somebody a nice, kind word. Tell them they look fine. You know, are you sad? You might even pray for them, whatever. Or you just talk to them just like a friend. You don't think anything of it at all. And then you... Then the road gets clear, you drive on, and so later the Lord will show you that talk that you had with this person changed their life. They got saved a little bit later because of you. Then they, in effect, these other people for Christ that in the ways that you never expected, and then at the point at time, you're going to receive the same rewards that <laughs> this person that you just talked to. And you had no clue what you were doing. And so the Lord was showing how all this stuff connected in this, what we do in this life, no matter how insignificant and how it would work in other people's life. And that's what these people were talking about. And so I explain a lot better in the book and give you better examples of it. But, you know, it, it, those are the type of things that I saw. We walked on. And we saw what I call Ezekiel's River. And, you know, it's like there's it's this huge river that was wider than wide, and, and this, and I can't explain it. And then I came to a tributary of the River of Life. Um, you know, we think of tributaries were water flowing into a river. This is a river flowing out of a river, like the River of Life. And there's tributaries that are flowing out from it. So it's it's opposite. <laughs> it's, it's opposite how it's. <laughs> how we think of, of tributaries. Uh, the river, the life, provides the tributaries and it flows out into the land. And so we came to one of these tributaries, and I, I, I mentioned this a lot of times when I speak in different places, is, is that uh, I saw all these children in, in by this place, and they were playing in the river, and so you know, the, what Jesus and I walked up to them, and... And he got in the water, and the kids were splashing each other. And this, you know, people get upset when I say this, but they can let them. I don't care. And so they, Jesus said something like, "You ready? You ready?" And they all splashed water on me, kicked water on me, and they were laughing. I've never been so happy. This is like when the water hit me; something changed inside of me. My 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 vision of, and thought of Jesus, who the Lord is, totally changed. He wasn't this marble stone faced figure that demanded that I do endless works to keep myself saved. I was secure in his hand. All I had to do was just trust him and honor him. Wow. And he'll get me through no matter what. Even when I have my doubts and fears and tribulations, I always remember this this place is kicking water on me and it got rid of myself, so to speak. And uh, got rid of me relying on myself at that time and, and everything. And it changed me. And it changed me for the better, not for the worst. <laughs> and, um, it was just a very special place. It was like, yeah, you just wish the Lord would just kick some water on them and, and, and loosen them mm. up a little bit. <laughs> well, didn't he say, come to me, all ye who are, you know, who, who hunger and thirst. I mean, just drink from drink you know <laughs> yeah. come to me and drink yep <laughs> and and it's so it, the water that, that that living water is just you know like he said to the the woman at the well what i have for you is <laughs> it's way better than what you're looking yeah, for yeah it's living better. water and then when you get personal then you, know? when you see it you you want to go back and tell people about it and then you want to you know yeah. you understand you that you may not be you know, the next Billy Graham or whatever, but what you do in this life has some effect for Jesus in ways you don't even comprehend. Right. right. And, um, and then he's got you here for a reason, and, and the Holy Spirit's sanctifying. I wish people would never um, take sanctification out of salvation because it's, it's part and partial of the same event. Because the Lord, will, you know, the sanctification is involves, you know, giving good news to your crushed spirit. You don't have to remain that way. Healing your broken heart, shattered life, he's healing it up. He's going to reveal the traumas and dramas that, that, that drove you. And you may not want to remember it, but he'll slowly reveal them to you so you can handle it. And you go, wow, that's why I act so dumb. That's, that's why I act this way. This is why I keep opening the door for the devil. And then you shut the door. He, he and, and you're sitting, you cap, whatever's holding you captive stops, and all. The, and the Lord keeps doing that until the day we die and, and head to heaven. And so sanctification lasts a lifetime in this life, 
And we don't we do disservice, I think, in Christian churches not talking about sanctification more. But sanctification is what it is. It, 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 yeah, it's working out for, what yeah. he is working in. Yeah, it's yeah, working, it's working out what he is working in. He's, yeah. it's, it's Romans chapter eight twenty eight. He predestined us to be conformed into the image of his dear son. That's what he's doing. He's we're becoming to live more according to his character traits and his na- his, his character traits. Of goodness, mercy, better each at it every day. None of us are going to be perfect. We're all going to make mistakes up to the point of then, but the process is you're learning to change. You're learning to be humble. You're learning to, yes, I messed up. I have to apologize to this person. I don't want to apologize to him, but I better apologize to him. Yeah. Up to your learning mistakes. to become loved. Yeah. yeah just, just, yep. You know, you know, lead by example. Don't push and pull people. Be a servant as much as you can. Right. You know, I'm not perfect. I do make mistakes. I can't answer every email people send me. And it's not yeah. you really, but I do the best I can. And, you know, um, and so he's working on me and he's working on you, Chris. He's working on everybody who's listening. Yeah. And that's what we need yeah. to really share on that. Yeah. It's okay to be worked on. <laughs> We're just becoming love. We're learning to become like the one who loved us first. We love because he first loved us and and that and that's already been done. Everything that needs to be done has been done and that's that's part of that eternal eternal uh uh reality that eternal truth that it's just it's timeless. It's a, it, it, I love that aspect of just by his stripes you were already healed. It's just it, it, you know and, and we we strive we we keep we keep trying to to, to fix ourselves and to perfect ourselves and it and, it, uh, it, and there's no other sacrifice for sin that that can be that that is left if we continue to keep making it about us and and and, and our and our dead works. It's just I think that's really coming across today, Brian. Yeah. I, I, I really feel strongly yeah. that you're you're an encouragement to a lot of people who have been frustrated and uh, and, and really tired, tired of pushing up pushing that rock up that hill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just uh, I just that's what I learned from my heaven experience. You don't have to push the rock up the hill. You know, <laughs> he pushes it up there for you. And uh, right. and but we do have to admit, you know, I had to admit. And I wrote in my book, and then you have to get the book of uh, Heaven Beckons to find out how the Lord healed me of some of my traumas, a major trauma that I had, and He had to work through that in order to to proceed further. And I had to actually go back yeah. and see it that it actually happened, and then learn to deal with it and forgive the people. And that is. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the stuff is pretty intense. It's, I'm, I don't want to ruin yeah. the book. You have to get the book for that. No, no. But, we all have our journeys. In my personal journey, the Lord has said to me, and I and I said, I asked him, I said, flat out, what is it in me that you would like to change? Do you know what he said? He said, the way that you view yourself. Yep. Ooh. Yep. Because a lot of my struggle, a lot of that, that inner healing won't happen until we change the way that we look at ourselves. Yeah. He restored the image of God in man. Yeah, yeah. In Him we live and move and have our ring. For from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. Yeah, we, and in Him they all hold together. Amen. Big, big difference. Yeah, amen, amen, <laughs> amen. amen. I tell you, amen. You know, it's one thing I learned from the heaven experiences that we were created in the image and likeness of God. It doesn't mean we were duplicates of God or we're little gods in God class. That's not it at all. Right. That's, that, that's, that's heresy, actually. But what it means right. is that we were created to reflect and govern our world according to the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, there you go. and sanctification of all us getting healed up so we can better reflect that until the day we go home. That's Amen. Because we, Amen. he's returning that image and likeness back to us so we get it. I'm to govern according to His righteousness, His love, His mercy, His truth. Uh, his, his righteousness, you know, love. What is love? Love, you know, is people don't understand what agape love is because you know we limit its definition. But if you take the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Latin, and look at how the agape and agapeo is translated in the Old Testament, out of the Septuagint, and the Hebrew word there, I think it's hesed. I think I may not, I may, I may not, I, I may be wrong. I can't remember. But then you go to the Latin, which is a caritas or caritas. And it's, and it's translated in King James as, in First Corinthians 13, as charity. It's, it's more than charity as we think. And charity used to mean nur, nur, nurturing, cherishing. You cherish 
nurture, edify, build up, rebuke, chasten, set boundaries, protective boundaries. That's that. That's what love does. Without our conditions getting in the way, you know, uh, I'm going to make the rain fall on the just and the unjust. That's love. He's cherishing you. He's nurturing all of humanity. He's he's revealing how good he is. He gives you free will, free moral agency to make decisions, even despite foreknowing. What decisions you may will ever make, he still let let you make your decisions, and 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 it's it's like he's not a slave to your decision making either. He doesn't lie around waiting for you to make decisions if he, he foreknew at all before you ever were, and he just works things out however he so wills in that regard, and so he's so just and merciful, and so then when we come back. Uh, to to this love, that love lets us do that, and that part of reflecting God's love involves that. I have to cherish, nurture, edify, also have to rebuke or approve, because like the Bible mm. says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Whom the Lord agapeos, mm. he chastens. Ah, yes. Uh, <laughs> I've been in the woodshed enough to know that he loves me, <laughs> Chris. <laughs> and so, um, at least I know uh, he cares. And then I, I move on, and I have to reflect that uh, to other people. Mm -hmm. It's difficult until mm -hmm. you let the Holy Spirit work in you to do it, and and sometimes you, 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 you do mess up. Other times, you know, we live in a real world, and we make mistakes, but, but by and large, you, you're improving slowly <laughs> to reflect that. So that's what the mm -hmm. Lord showed me about heaven, is getting us back to this the sanctified state where we're reflecting his character traits and his nature, objective reality, you know, to relive by what he reveals, not by what culture reveals. Yes. And shine it's light. It's the kingdom of God, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's the kingdom of God. And that's what he showed me about, mostly about heaven, was, was those things. And then, you know, of course, we walked, kind of wrapped this up real quick. I don't want to take too much of your time, but we came... We walked through the city a little bit. We came back to the city, a circumventious little adventure, but uh, came back to the city and we came to this big building and I can't even describe any of this really well. I mean, these buildings, there's no way that geometrically, how could they stand up? And how could a building be that large and that big? So we walked into this building and it was a banquet hall being prepared. And all, you know, all these people uh, that's basically what you like to do maybe you know what you really like to do you'll be doing in heaven <laughs> it, it's like a working vacation that's the best way i can describe it and and you love it you love your job i guess you say so these people who love to cook and organize and fix things and decorate we're helping the angels up there decorate this big wedding hall that's what it was and um and so they're getting ready for a great wedding feast and so he walked through there with Jesus and people was, you know, they, Jesus would stop and talk to him and, and stuff as we walked by. It's hard to explain time without time <laughs> how all this occurred, but, but walking through this place and then we walked through it, we came out another door and he says, time to, Bailey, time to go. So we went back to the field of reunion. We went back through the gate and um, walked back down to where I entered from. And, you know, where I landed in front of him, I, on this big rock, I, I seen this rock before in my after-death experience, but this time he's just, he smiled and he, he chatted with me in ways I can't even describe, and he blew on me, and I went backwards, and, and I floated right back into my body, right through the cupboard above the bed, that little storage area, and came down, and my dog was real happy and excited, and... And I got up and I felt refreshed, Chris. I felt so good. I felt like I slept for a month. And, um, <laughs> and I wasn't grouchy anymore. I didn't have an attitude. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go beat up all the guys in church for abandoning me, you know. <laughs> that night, because that night before they left me holding the bag. And I wanted to get revenge and all this stupid stuff I was thinking. All that vanished. And I was happy as, uh, happy as all get out. So I went to work. And my supervisor said this, I'm not lying, I am not kidding. She said, Brian, who have you been with? You're glowing. I go, wow. I, didn't, I didn't say I was with Jesus, you might get the wrong idea. I just said, uh, no, I just had a good night's sleep. <laughs> 
I had people saying, Brian, you're glowing. So I had some type of glow about me. I wasn't like Moses glowing like a bright light or nothing. Because I could turn out the lights. I, you know, I, all I could see was me, you know. But um, I didn't see no light mm -hmm. glowing from me personally. But people around me for like three days said I glowed. You had a glow about you. There was something, you know, you, where have you been? What, who do you talk to? All kinds of amazing things happened right after that. Yeah. I could go up to animals well, Brian, and stuff, man. It was, yeah. it was incredible. And the animals wouldn't be I, I hope it didn't. I, <laughs> I, I I hope it didn't just end there. I hope you had further, you know, encounters with the Lord that you you know you don't need to tell us about. But I hope that that led to further revelations and further, you know, just experiences that just has kept you kept you on the straight and narrow. Because, I mean, I, I mean, this has provoked me to jealousy. But I can't I can't imagine just living off of just that one encounter. I would want more. I would be just be give me more. I wouldn't want to. I mean, I'd be frustrated to to just. You don't have to go back to just... Well, let me really answer that. Yeah, there have been, but yeah. I don't seek them. They come. Okay. I don't seek them. I, they come. I, I learn to rest. I rest in the Lord. If he wants to have a special little encounter, a special thing, it will. One of the most amazing things that did happen right after that was I call it a dream. And I talked about it a few times and um, to people, but it was a dream. All I was doing was sitting on somebody's lap like a little kid, and a book was turning pages in a different language I couldn't read. And it was a different language was reading to me. Every time, and that dream lasted... It would continue where it left off for about three or four months, and then it would die out and then pick up a little bit later. But every time that dream happened, the scriptures opened up in a, in a marvelous way that I have never, ever could ever describe. And, that, and I still look forward to ever having a dream like that again, because it's the best dream I've ever had. Um, you think it's kind of strange. You feel like you're sitting on somebody's lap, reading to you like a little kid, turning the pages, and... Um, you know, it kind of reminded me when I was a, a little kid or my parents would read to me. And, but this time this was the scripture. It was, this was the Bible. And I can't tell you the language to be precise, but it's, it's the language of heaven is all I got to say. And, and it would just say that. And I wake up with this incredible go in the Bible and, and everything connects I could find. And I go in my Bible search. There's a lot of my, uh, encounters are it was when I'm reading the Bible and I'm studying and how he does that. I don't go seeking these things. I don't go mm -hmm. out and say, oh, I want another fix. No, I don't need that. I got all I need, really, to tell you the truth. But the Lord does, uh, you know, reward those who do seek him mm -hmm. diligently. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't James say, draw near to the Lord and he will draw near to you. So I, I think he does. There is this response and this back and forth that, you know, he, you know, we, I think sometimes there are times when the Lord just kind of, you know, he comes after us and other times he hides and, and then we come after him and it's this love relationship. Amen. 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 Another little encounter. Yeah. It really helps you when you're in spiritual warfare because he will show you things in spiritual warfare. I was driving up to Eagle Butte to do some ministry up there and I, and I felt the Lord saying, I'm driving, come, I'm approaching um, Hot Springs, going there. And I said, Lord, you're calling me. I can't pull over. There's no place to pull over. He, he said, no. So I'm driving and the top of the car opened up. I could see the, see the sky, and then in this vision that I was having right above my head, there was this creature over above Eagle Butte, and the Lord told me what to do in spiritual warfare to do it. So I'm driving down the road, I'm doing it, and then we had a great revival break out there. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> but things like that happen. Well, <laughs> but you know, I don't make it. I don't make it like real public or known. Those are the type of things that do happen on occasion. I don't seek them. He, he, he calls me to it. That's a good way to put it. This is how I'd like to just end this, Brian. I'm reminded of a mutual friend story. You know, when when God was touching a woman, he you know he 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 he, he had a word of knowledge that uh, you know there are many people in the room, and I think you were there. I don't remember exactly, but. Just everyone saw God touching this woman, and they wanted a touch from the Lord. They wanted it. He wanted it. He said, Lord, why don't, why don't you touch me that way? And the Lord spoke right back to him, and, and it was an invitation, because the Lord wants to touch you today, the way that he touched Brian. Brian, would you pray into that? Because I really feel like many of you are just, just desperate 
desperate to know the Lord as Brian has, has shared today and, and and we're still getting to know the Lord. There's just this never ending. But you really, really, really need an encounter with Lord you with the Lord and yet I, I really sense that you, you you're at you're at the end of your rope. Brian, would you pray for that one right now? Heavenly Father, we just thank you right now, Lord. We just ask you right now just to reach into people's hearts right now. Even the person out there who's sad, who's blue, who wants to give up hope, they don't, they don't, make, they don't make sense of what's going on in their life. They don't make what's, any sense of what's going on in the world. They don't grasp it. They've heard doctrines that are taught in, in the church that are not coming to pass. They can't get their heads around it. They've been hurt by people in the church. They've been hurt by people outside the church. Lord, there's so many yeah. traumas and dramas and things that happen to us all. So I just thank you, Heavenly Father, right now in the name of Jesus. I just thank you right now, Lord, that you just touch their heart right now. If you're listening and you need prayer for, I just ask you to put your hand on your heart right now. It's a contact point. I just do this for no particular reason, folks. I just ask, it just helps the person receiving it. So if you've been battered by life and you've been bruised and you, you're, you're hurting and you need a healing or whatever it is, just put your hand on your heart. I'm doing it right now on my own. So, Heavenly Father, I just thank you right now in the name of Jesus. I ask you to open their, their, their sight to see wherever trauma or whatever hurt it is that caused this, or wherever door that's been opened up to cause the devil to come in to be shut right now in the name of Jesus. I ask for your healing light. You're, you're our healer, Lord Jesus. You came to heal the broken heart. I just ask you to heal, heal their heart. I ask you, Lord, in this day and age, Lord, there are crushed spirit is just being crushed or poor in spirit they're just downtrodden beaten down by culture and life things are coming against them and asking peace peace in their life and these things be stilled and their broken hearts mend it they ask whatever addiction they they keep they want to be free from the stuff is whatever it is they keep repeating it over and over again open the door so they can see what's causing it and I ask that yes. the door to be shut in the name of Jesus. Yes. Heal their heart right now yes. in the name of Jesus. Heal the wounds in their heart. I just thank you, Heavenly Father, for whatever is holding them bondage and, cap and captive to bad thinking. Whatever it's the reason. Maybe it's words other people spoke to them. Whatever it is, Lord, just release them from it. I just ask right now to fill their life up with peace, joy, hope. I just ask right now in the Heavenly Father, just thank you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I ask for the people to be free, to be healed. I ask the Lord if they need physical healing, I ask that they be healed in the name of Jesus. Here it comes. I just thank you in the name of Jesus. It's going to flow right into you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just thank you, Jesus. Here it oh, goes. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Touch them right now. Open up their spiritual eyes and ears. Calm their hearts. Calm their hearts. In Jesus' name. Just, I just ask yes. that peace be upon them. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. His burden is easy. His yoke is light. Oh, yes. Amen. Thank you, Lord. He's healing hearts. I can I could feel His presence. He is really healing hearts today. He's lifting those burdens. Oh, thank you, thank you Lord. Forgiveness is coming. I, I just sense forgiveness. People you haven't been able to forgive for a very long time. God has given the grace for that right now. I thank you for that, recon that reconciliation coming now to families, to, to friends, where there's been division. You're bringing unity right now. Thank you, Lord. You came to destroy the works of the enemy. And you. <laughs> Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for Brian today. I thank you for this word. God, thank you for showing up. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, Amazing. Oh. Amazing, Lord. Oh, Ooh, I didn't expect this. <laughs> wow. Thank, thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Thank you so much, Brian. For, this has been amazing. Thank you for coming on. I mean, thank you. Wow. Bless you, my friend. Bless you, brother. We're going to do this again soon. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to do you it know? soon. Amen. God is faithful. Yes. God is faithful. I, I want you to get the book, Heaven Beckons, Beckoning You. Yes. It's coming. And, and if you haven't caught his first book, Land Unknown, you're going to get a hold of that as well. 
Christian Marauder. Don't forget to subscribe to his YouTube channel. And, and don't forget to subscribe here. Give, give us that like. If you appreciate this content, smash that like button. Come on, share this with someone who needs the encouragement today. And subscribe as well to the reboot. It's time for a reboot. Amen, Brian. It's Amen. time. It's time for a reboot. <laughs> Thanks again for watching. <laughs> and uh, don't forget to introduce yourself in the comment section. Let us know um, if you need to get a hold of Brian, too. Um, Brian, how can they get a hold of you? Well, they can go to the... Uh, um, I have a website called After Hours Ministry, but it's an old website. I'm trying to get the money up so I can revise it, but it's... I have contact information there, but you can just go by... Um, go to the Christian Marauder on YouTube see that all my contact information's there usually into the screen on the on the videos and if you like to contact me you can just use the emails addresses that I have there I just use the website right now just as a point of reference a lot of the videos that I had on there got taken off um, um, due to censorship <laughs> There was a channel yeah, that I was, yeah. uh, I was doing a radio show on and stuff, and they took off the entire channel. And so that guy's channel that I linked to is gone, and some of the other channels I was linked to were gone because of censorship. Mm -hmm. We live in such a day and age. Well, they can't cancel the Holy Spirit. Yeah, they can't. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, again, thanks again for watching. If they did. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks again for watching, guys. I love you all. And uh, Brian will be doing this again in the future. I know I'll be talking to you again soon. And I'll be talking to you as well in the next video. Catch you next time. Thanks for watching the reboot. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. To show your support, please share this with your friends, give us a like, and introduce yourself in the comment section below. We'd love to pray for you.